we're often looking for acceptance in all the wrong places because our, if you put a dipstick in your heart and you, you bring it out to, to check your acceptance level, your favor level, uh, it gets low at times. And, and so we start looking for God's acceptance from other people. I, I see people lots of times, I'll, I'll just say, oh, she's looking for acceptance in all the wrong places. She doesn't realize that Jesus loves her. She doesn't realize He's already decided to accept her. And so um, there are 10 basic areas of life um, uh, from which we're often weighed or assessed or it's determined whether how favorable you are in these 10 areas. Um, looks, just our looks. People evaluate us, they weigh us, they assess us based on our looks, right? If you could be more look, good looking, you would be. I mean, if you could be, you would do that. I mean, everybody tries, everybody, but then things happen with age and weight and, and lots of stuff, even scars and accidents and things that uh, cause us not to be acceptable. And then there's a standard, and we don't even know who they are, but there's these people who say, this is what's beautiful. This is the standard of beauty. And it changes from country to country, culture to culture, even generation to generation. There's things that we think are beautiful now, but back in the 1700s, they didn't see beauty that way. And there's other countries that don't see beauty that way. So it's a very fluid and nebulous kind of thing that's always changing and how do you keep up with it and and if you do keep up with it and you are deemed beautiful well just wait because you'll that season will pass and wrinkles will creep in and stuff happens and everything goes south and you, you get weight put on in places you weren't expecting it before you never had a problem before and now you do and so if, that, if your whole acceptance is based on appearance, you're in trouble and you will have a nosedive. You will not feel good. That's why, that's why in Hollywood and places like that where they put such an emphasis on external beauty, uh, people inject all kinds of things in their face and faces and actually wreck their appearance. It's a, it's a horrible thing to draw acceptance from people based on our looks. It's a bondage. It's a major bondage. So much so that Peter said, don't do it. It's not about plating your hair with pearls and gold and, and, and the fashion of the day. He said, it's not that. It's the hidden man of the heart. That's where true beauty lies. It's the hidden man of the heart. Show them how beautiful you are by what you do and, and how you treat people. If you've ever seen someone who looked really beautiful in a checkout line of a grocery store, and then all of a sudden their beauty is completely lost by the way they talk to the checkout gal and they snark at her and they bark at her and they tell her, you know, and all of a sudden the beauty has gone because of the way they talk. And at the same time, I've seen people who were not physically beautiful and when they spoke, springtime would come out of their voice and they ju you just tell that they're just an incredibly beautiful person. And so this whole thing with looks is, is, a, is a perilous thing and if we're trying to get acceptance by our looks, uh, we're, in, we're in for a roller coaster of a ride, okay? Second one is intelligence. And, and there are people who grade us on how smart we are. And, and we're always being weighed uh, whether we're valuable or not, whether we're acceptable or not by how smart we are. So we put a premium on, on people who have degrees behind their names or initials behind their names or they've been to a certain school, if they've been to Oxford or Yale, we hold them as a, you know, a higher premium. Uh, if they've got a, um, you know, a high education, we say that they're more valuable in our society. You ever get around some of those people? They're not always that nice to be with. And, then, and sometimes, uh, I remember as a kid, we'd, we'd, they'd come into our lives and we'd laugh at them because they were sociably unacceptable and they couldn't do ordinary things because they were, they were too smart, you know? They couldn't fish. They, they didn't know how to hike. They'd get lost in the woods. They didn't know how to paddle a canoe. What kind of crazy people are these? How can we accept them? And so anyway, uh, this whole thing with 
intelligence and education um, and now what they're given for education that wouldn't matter I'm just not impressed with where they've gone and and uh, what kind of school they have because it's it's very dysfunctional number three your talents or skills or the job you have and people always weigh us by our job or what our job is going to be or what kind of skills we have or what kind of talents we have and they'll often uh, I'll meet people and they say what do you do and I know as soon as they say that I'm about to be weighed I'm about to be weighed on whether I'm valuable or not or whether I'm acceptable or not and if, if I say I'm a writer, all of a sudden the scale goes up. If I say I'm a pastor, sometimes it depends on the area. The scale will either go down really quickly or go up really quickly. It just depends on who I'm with. I remember being uh, in, a, in a, a, a little mini bus down in Florida one time and, and uh, something just happened. I got on the bus and, and something just clicked. Everybody was, we were all talking and just having a good time and all complete strangers and then finally someone said what do you do and I knew I was gonna be weighed then when I said I'm a pastor everything went south they just everyone got quiet because they're thinking about whether they swore or not or uh, when was the last time they've been to church or you know if you say you're an undertaker uh, I mean there's just different things and and that changes used to be if you said you're a policeman that'd be one thing now if you say a policeman it might not be that high on the acceptable scale and so it changes and, uh, uh, and people are looking for ways to get acceptance that way. Where you live, uh, if you say you're from New York, I, when I travel, people say, where are you from? I'll say I'm from New York, and they, oh, really? Wow, wow, New York, and I say, not New York City, a uh, little town out in the country, you know, and it and, uh, depends on where you live, and uh, people weigh, you know, if you're from the West Coast or East Coast, if you say you're from Arkansas, it may not, it may not ring too many bells on the acceptance scale. You know, just different places. Uh, how wealthy you are, how rich you are, how much stuff you have. Uh, people weigh us on, on our wealth. They say there's no such thing as an ugly billionaire. You know, you'll see this billionaire and he's got this uh, beautiful young girl on his arm. So there's no way she could possibly be attracted to him, but his wealth makes him beautiful, makes him acceptable to her. Your family and how your family functions, how whole your family is, how, you, how even the order in your family, uh, where you are in the pecking order, all of that. Uh, your health, whether you have loss or injuries, ailments, uh, we, we weigh people based on that. Our spiritual heritage, uh, where we come from spiritually, and, and there are people who use that to gain acceptance, how popular we are in culture, and uh, our love and our—if you've been abused or 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 anything like that—it it changes your acceptance level. So now let me just do this on on each of these ten things uh, on a scale from one to ten. Let's evaluate ourselves, okay? So on a scale of one to ten, how good looking are you? I took Isaac on that retreat the other day, and the reason is all the girls in the retreat behaved a lot better once Isaac came in, and they're on their best behavior because he's such a handsome young guy, and so that was a plus for me. On a scale from one to 10, how, how acceptable are you? On a scale from one to 10, 10 being high, one being low, how intelligent are you? How smart are you? How much should we accept you based on how, how smart you are? One to ten. Talents, skills make you employable. One to ten. How, how, how uh, are you, uh, you going to uh, have a real high job? Uh, we, we had a prophecy one time that we were going to have lawyers and doctors uh, in our church, and, and that was prophecy was in part because all we had were farmers and loggers, and, and it was kind of like uh, we were just this, you know, almost like a blue-collar church, and the prophecy was that someday we're going to have 
uh, higher level people come in our midst, lawyers and doctors. Well, we had lots of doctors end up joining our church and some, I remember I'm one lawyer in particular, but uh, they were just ordinary people and they had dysfunctions just like everyone else. And I mean, you could be a lawyer and be bouncing your checks all over town and just because you're a lawyer doesn't mean anything. And so we don't, we, it, it was a real thing for me to think through this whole thing. We don't want to weigh people based on what they do, but we do tend to do that. We say, oh, you know, he's, he's a musician, he's an artist, he's, and we weigh people. He's a philosopher. I remember I was coming back from Germany on a plane, and uh, this guy was talking a lot. He was sitting beside me, and, and they were serving drinks, and so he was getting a little tipsy before we even got out of Germany. And... Uh, uh, he said, uh, we became acquainted, and he said, Pam, what do you do? I knew then I was about to be weighed, and, and I knew if I say pastor, that's usually the end of the conversation. That, and so I learned to lie. I would just tell him something other than being a pastor because uh, that I, I never got to witness to anybody once they find out you're a pastor. And, so I said, well, what do you do? He said, I'm a philosopher. And I said, well, I'm a philosopher. He said, really? Tell me your philosophy. And I said, well, tell me your philosophy. And so he told me about UFOs mixed with Egyptian hieroglyphics and <laughs> all, all this crazy, crazy stuff. And, and uh, just, you know, and so he said, what's your philosophy? So I told him my testimony and I took him from where I was and how I met Jesus. And there was a part way through when I was talking about Jesus being alive today and Jesus stepped into my now and changed my life. He stopped me and he says, pen, pen, stop, stop. He said, you're blowing my mind. And so I stopped talking and he kept drinking. <laughs> and then he said, uh, after a while he said, uh, you know, when we land in Toronto, I have a lot of friends who are philosophers and they would be really interested in your philosophy. Would you come and meet with them and tell them your philosophy that you told me? I just thought that was really interesting that if I'd said I was a pastor, I wouldn't have got very far, but I don't mean to make light of lying and uh, just that I just could never witness to anybody once they found out I was a pastor. That was the end of it usually. So anyway, where are you on a scale of one to 10? You up there, or down low or middle? Most of us want to be in the middle. I, I, wanted to, I was a straight C student and I thought that was good. I thought, yeah, that's where I want to be. I just, but when I got a few Ds, man, that was hard on my soul. Heather, on the other hand, my wife, in all her years of school, from the first grade to the last grade, she never had anything but an A. And she married me. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I'm straight C and feeling really good about that because I just want to be in the middle. I just want to be average. And uh, it was kind of like the, she was from England, you know, and it was kind of like, it was kind of like the Queen of England marrying a homeless man. <laughs> You know, we just didn't match on, it, on almost anything, and certainly not on this scale here. So, uh, so uh, where you live, uh, locality, Penyan, Yates County, uh, what kind of, uh, if you say you're from Ohio, you might get a few more points. If you say you're from Chile, you maybe get a few more points. I'm from Chile, oh. If you say you're from Venezuela or Cuba, maybe not so much, or Nicaragua, it all goes. If you say you're, I found that among the Latinos that I was working with, that they had this scale and they, they would put, they'd put Puerto Rico or put, uh, Mexico, just depending on who you're talking to, they'd put it low on the scale and they'd put other places high on the scale. I found that very interesting because to me it was all the same. Where you are in your family, how big your family is, um, how your family functions, your health, spiritual heritage. There are people who want to hide the fact that there are Amish roots or their Mennonite roots. I met people who just wanted to distance themselves from that. It, uh, it, it invoked too many questions. It, it was too hard on them. And other people will say it because 
they feel really good about their roots and, and they should. And so they would, you know, put that as a, a plus, not a minus. How popular you are, how much love you have or have experienced. Well, let's, let's now take this scale and let's put Jesus on the scale. Jesus from one to 10. So the first thing is looks. And I know they make movies and many dramas on, on the life of Jesus, but here's what Isaiah prophesied about Jesus. For he shall grow before them as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, which is beauty. And, we sh and when we see him, there's no beauty that we shall desire him. Jesus was not good looking. He could actually turn around and walk back through the crowd and no one would notice him. He just blended in. In order to make movies about Jesus, he has to be ruggedly handsome, but the reality is Isaiah said Jesus had no physical beauty. He had no form or physical beauty that we would desire him. Jesus was not good looking, yet God planned his life to the nth degree. Intelligence, education, the Jews said, how does this man know having never learned? I doubt that Jesus had hardly any education. All Jews seemed to know how to read and write. That was normal for that period, but Jesus didn't have a chance. You know, Paul would say, I sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Gamaliel was like the greatest teacher of that period, and Paul was one of his students. So he gets more points because of who he sat under. Jesus, they said, how, how does this guy know this stuff? He's never, he's never gone to school. He's never been to rabbinical school. Talents and jobs, they said, isn't this the carpenter? And you could hear the way they, they said it, like that was an offense. Like, is this, how, isn't he the carpenter? How is it that he's doing these marvelous things? And they said, uh, uh, this is Mark 6, 3. He said, isn't this the, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joseph and Judah and Simeon? Are not his sisters among him, among us? And they were offended at him. He's just a carpenter. I think there must have been lots of carpenters or, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a high class job, just an ordinary job. As far as where you're from, <laughs> they, they said, hey, hey, Nathaniel, we found the Messiah and, and he's from Nazareth. And he crinkles up his nose and he says, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Nazareth? Are you kidding me? The, 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 the Messiah coming out of that armpit, that dump, that hole in the ground, Nazareth? And he said, come and see. That's John 1, 40, 1, chapter 1, verse 46. As far as, as, far as uh, being wealthy, uh, Jesus died with the clothes on his back. He was always giving, but even when it came time to pay taxes, it, he just would tell Peter to pull a fish out of the sea and take the coins out of his mouth. I mean, he didn't seem to have a lot of money. He actually had a group of ladies following him that out of their substance, they paid for the paid for the, the team as they traveled at one point in time. I mean, he was not a wealthy man by, he, he was buried in a borrowed grave. Uh, doesn't look like he had a home. Doesn't look like he, well, he didn't have a donkey. He walked everywhere. When they, Mary and Joseph dedicated him to the Lord, they, they bought turtle doves as part of the dedication. Well, when you read the law, you're supposed to bring a lamb or a calf. Uh, there's a number of things that you're supposed to bring. And then there's this little thing that says, if they're really, really poor, let them bring turtle doves. And the whole idea is that anybody can get a turtle dove, even the poor. And so that's what they offered for Jesus' dedication because they didn't have anything. The way they got to escape into uh, Egypt is the, the wise men came with gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and they hawked the myrrh and, and got rid of the, uh, changed the frankincense in the coins and took the gold and, and were able to live in Egypt on the lamb 
for a long time until the, the king who wanted him dead died. So anyway, uh, he says of himself, he says, foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests. I don't have a pillow. I don't, I don't have any place to lay my head. Powerful, powerful thing. As far as his, his family, his family didn't believe in him. He came from a large family. He's also number one son. When Joseph died, somewhere between the time Jesus was 12 and the time he was 30, when his ministry began, Joseph died. So Jesus had to be the breadwinner. He's responsible for the family. He's responsible for Mary until he dies. So on the cross, he looks to John. He says, John, this is now your mother. Mother, John's going to look after you. And John looked after Mary to the end. They both died in Ephesus. Mary's buried there. John's buried there. And um, he kept her. He looked after her. But Jesus was responsible. So one of the last things he does on the cross is he cares about his mom which is very, very powerful. Injuries and loss, well, he, he suffered loss. I mean, his dad died. Uh, there's no indication Jesus was ever sick or had any physical ailments, of course, until the cross. Uh, his, spirit, his spiritual heritage, you know, what would he get from one to 10 on that? Jews were despised. Uh, we, re we, we love the children of Israel. We marvel at, at their history and the way God treated them. But anywhere you go, uh, uh, the Jews, there's this anti-Semitism that still is really, really strong. Uh, I, I remember being so shocked to hear it because I grew, up, I grew up in Canada where we didn't have that. And I came down here, we never heard it. When I went to Europe and the first time I saw Jew-hating people on the streets protesting Jews just for being people, or taking their, their tombs, their, their gravestones, and flipping them over, taking them out of the cemetery, and making a plaza out of them because they despise the, as a people. Uh, and hearing people say bad things about the Jews, I'd never heard that before. And so Jesus, his spiritual heritage on a scale of one to 10, depends on who you're talking to, but it, it can fluctuate from one to 10. As far as his, his popularity, said that Jesus was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, we, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. He was the stone the builders rejected. Yeah, he was a man of, uh, uh, who suffered. They actually spit upon him. The whole denominational leadership, so to speak, stood up in front of him and spit in his face. Talk about rejection, popularity. Mm. Love and abuse, you know, how people treat him and how he treated them. Uh, pretty amazing that you go to your hometown synagogue after having been away and you tell them how scripture is fulfilled in their hearing and they want to throw you off this cliff into the garbage dump. There's a perpetual burning garbage dump below that cliff. That cliff is still there today. And they just wanted to throw Jesus off of it. I mean, they were so angry with him. They wanted to cast him headlong. They're filled with wrath. Uh, we see Jesus as really popular. And there are moments when he was, when the great crowds followed him. But there's this constant eating away at it where the, the Pharisees were constantly trying to chip away at that saying he's a deceiver and he's deceived he loves women and wine he's a glutton he's a wine bibber uh, uh, he's a he's a, a known sinner he eats with sinners I mean they're always chipping away at it so on a scale from one to ten uh, if we measure Jesus it's like one 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 I mean, he didn't score very high on any of these things. Yet his life was planned by God. It's almost like the scales that we put so much time and energy and effort into, God doesn't even care about. He said, don't make them, don't make them handsome. I don't want people to say the reason they're following Jesus is because he's so handsome. Just make them plain, ordinary. People who've seen Jesus, they're always shocked at how Jewish he looks. He's very Jewish.
And so, but the paintings in most churches, he's blonde and blue eyed, got great hair, great, great beard. I think Jesus was by design given all these ones or zeros to help us realize that these are not the way to measure people. In terms of spiritual beauty, no one more beautiful than Jesus. He didn't have schooling, but there was no one wiser than Jesus. He had wisdom beyond Solomon. Solomon was considered the wisest man who ever lived. God said that, that no one would be wiser than Solomon and then she, until Jesus came along. And he's much wiser than Solomon. In terms of all the other things that we measure people by, let's just go through it for a minute. In terms of skills and talents, I mean, yeah, he was a carpenter, but he could put people's lives back together. He can make people whole. <laughs> Who else could do that? None of the great philosophers could do that. In terms of locality, yeah, he's from Nazareth, but, but he's also the prince of a place called peace. And he's the, the, the one who reigns over the new Jerusalem. Uh, in terms of wealth, he's so, he, became, he was so rich, but he came, became poor for our sakes to make us rich. And then he gets to live in heaven where there's, streets of gold. Everything gets flipped around. Everything, everything that's put a value down here, you know, you hear the old joke of the guy who wants to take his gold to heaven and somehow figures out a way to stash it away in this coffin. When he appears before St. Peter at the gates, he's got his bag of gold and, and Peter says, oh, more road fill. You know, mm -hmm. fill more potholes. It's a joke. Uh, but Jesus scores on, on everything that's everything that really matters. He's off off the chart spiritually. I mean, he has all the he has the gifts of the Spirit. He has the Holy Spirit and can give the Holy Spirit away. How rich is that? You're limited in how good looking you you'll ever be but there's no limit on how spiritually beautiful you can become. There's no limits on how wise you can become. Wisdom actually goes out in the street and says, come and get me, you can have me, take me home. You're, there's unlimited amount of wisdom that's available for you. There's an unlimited amount of grace available for you. So in terms of talents, you may not be able to be the best of anything in the natural, but you can help someone put their marriage back together and you got grace to help their, help their young people live for God. You have grace to inspire people and come into the kingdom. I mean, there's no limits on what you can have. There's no limits on, on any of these graces that are important. Watch and see in these next few days how much and how often you weigh people on the first scale that we did, based on how beautiful they are, what kind of job they have, how much money they have, how intelligent they are with their educational background, their pedigree. And if you're asking those questions, you have to step back and say, why am I asking? What's, is my scale broken? And we need to flip out. There needs to be a moment where you say, I don't care about any of these things. What, what's important is how, how spiritually beautiful they are and, and that they've, they've been, a, they're, they're dispensers of grace and they're spiritually rich. And then they're the things that we're to put a premium on. And we have to switch out, make sure that our kids are raised in an environment where they feel they don't feel behind in any good thing because of the grace of God that's available to them. Amen. It's a whole different way of looking. Yeah.